Hello, Thorn Creek Church. Good to see all of you. You look great. Uh, God is good. Can we just put our hands together and praise God? Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? Welcome those of you who are online. Thank you for tuning in. I'm excited about this message, guys. I, I feel like I haven't preached in a while. It just feels like that. And uh, I'm so grateful for the ministry of Pastor Jeremy and Pastor Nick um, for their preaching ministry. I'm so grateful for them. And we have people here. Uh, I'm excited about this. Thank you for your faithfulness and your prayers. God is so good. Um, If you're watching online, I want to encourage you to watch the entire message. Uh, I just really feel like the Lord is moving in a special way. And I want to encourage you. I don't know where you're at right now in, in your relationship with God. But my prayer is that you take one step closer to Jesus today. Is that cool? You take one step closer to God today. Um, When was the last time you heard a word from God? When was the last time God spoke to you about something? How close do you want to walk with God? What's a good relationship with God look like for you? How close do you want to be with him? Do you want to know his will for your life? Do you want to know his purpose for your life? Um, You know, this uh, last week... um, I went with my wife on a work trip, and we went to Washington, D.C., and uh, last time we were there was a number of years ago, right? Maybe about four years ago, maybe longer, something like that. Yeah, here's a, uh, we were at the Washington Monument and saw some really cool fireworks. This was the grand finale that you're watching, and we were sitting on this uh, bed sheet from the hotel, and there was no funny business going on. There were too many people around us. But uh, we were, um, you can see how many people that were there. It was just a lot of people. And, and uh, <clears throat> when, we, um, when we were done, um, we went ahead and, and walked and uh, went down, I don't know what it's Pennsylvania Avenue or whatever it was, but it was just a mass of humanity going down. I felt really bad. There were some cars that were in intersections that were waiting for the people to get by. Well, they would have waited there for literally hours. But uh, uh, we, were, we had to walk a few blocks away to get an Uber. And uh, the, it was too congested. And, and we had to walk a few blocks and a... <clears throat> Excuse me. And while we were walking, um, we were thinking, okay, um, we got to find a place where the Uber can come in and pick us up. So we eventually called one, and uh, I, I, I called him, and and, uh, and when I called him, I, I discovered it's like a red uh, Prius or something like that. And I thought, okay, we gotta we gotta wait for this thing. And we're waiting for I don't know 20 minutes. And something inside of me tells me, I believe it was the Spirit of God, tells me, Reuben, call him because he's going to change his mind. Because there was so much traffic, I was thinking, this guy's going to change his mind. He's going to realize how much traffic there is, and he's going to say, forget it. So sure enough, I call him, and I said, look, if you're going to back out of this date, you know, this relationship, tell me now. Don't let me, don't lead me on, and I don't want to sit here on the curb waiting for you, thinking you're going to come, and you don't come. So he uh, eventually picked us up, but uh, we had to like look on our on our phone to see like what road he was coming down because uh, there were police everywhere blocking traffic and trying to get traffic out, and it was just craziness. And I we were looking and trying to find a good place to wait for him, and eventually he showed up. But we had to walk quite a bit uh, for him to show up, and it made me think about our relationship with God. It made me think about our relationship with God. You, you know, I, I believe we have a part in our relationship with God, and it involves us walking to him and with him. You hear what I'm saying? Has, has, that this, this is the kind of thing. Um, Jimmy, do you mind helping me out with this, brother? Come on up here, Jimmy. Jimmy doesn't mind. He's done this before. <laughs> I'm going to have Jimmy. Uh, this is, J- Jimmy is, is, attends Thorn Creek. He's a super cool guy. And, and uh, my relationship with Jimmy, if I'm like right here with Jimmy and this is where I hang out with him, what is our relationship going to look like? It's probably going to look pretty good, right? Pretty tight and the longer we walk together. But what is my relationship going to look like if he stays over there and I'm over here? Well, it's, it's not going to be as close, is it? It's not going to be as close, but when, if, I, if I walk towards him and I choose to walk with him, eventually he's going to share some things with me, and eventually I'm going to share some things with him, 
And he's going to get to know my heart. I'm going to get to know his heart. And we're going to grow together, aren't we? Aren't we? Okay, thank you, brother. Um, I, I, want, I want you to see that because this is the kind of relationship that God wants to have with you. God wants to walk with you. God wants to walk with you. Turn to the person next to you and just tell them he's talking to you right now. Can you do that? He, God wants to walk with you you. I think the real question is, do you really want to walk with God? I think that's the question. Do you really want to walk with God? Or are you as close to God as you think you are? What if, what if you were really a few blocks away, but in your mind, you were thinking you're shoulder to shoulder? What if? Hebrews chapter 6 has this message. And the message is this, don't walk away. Don't walk away. Say, don't walk away out loud with me. Don't walk away. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, don't walk away. Don't walk away. Sometimes we walk away from work or from businesses or from relationships or friends or church or whatever it is. I've walked away before. I remember seventh grade playing football and I just got sick of football and I got sick of this coach and I decided to walk away and I regretted it ever since. I walked away, regretted it ever since. From that point on, I said to myself, I'm never going to walk away from something again like that. I'm going to commit to it. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But maybe you've been there before where you've been tempted to walk away. In Hebrews, in this letter that we're looking at, there's these Christians, these Hebrew Christians, Christians, and they've experienced some suffering under the hand of this evil emperor named Nero. And right around AD 49, AD 50, uh, people, their friends have died, and it's been a horrific experience. And now they're thinking about walking away. And you've been there before. The writer of Hebrews knows this. He's like, look, I know you guys, you signed up for this life with God. You signed up to go to church. You signed up to do all this, and things aren't going like you hoped. It's harder than you thought. There's some suffering involved, even death. And now, deep down inside, you're thinking, I don't know if it's worth it. I think I'd rather walk. And the writer of Hebrews is like, don't walk away. Don't walk away. Stay in, stay in the fight. Stay in the fight. I ran into someone at, at Starbucks recently. Um, this person never has visited Thorn Creek Church, but they, they know I'm a pastor somehow. I think they know someone that knows me kind of thing. But I, I know them, and, and, and I don't know their name. You, you ever have those relationships? You, you, they're familiar. You say hello, but you don't know their name. That's what this relationship is with this guy and myself. Seems like a nice guy, but he's never, never, ever, you know. Anyway, but uh, he asked me this question. I hadn't seen him in a, like a long time, and he doesn't know why. I haven't been around, and I didn't tell him. But anyway, he asked me, he said, so uh, um, are, are you, are you um, still with the church, or are you done with that? It's exactly how he put it. Are you still with the church, or are you done with that? And I thought about that question, and my first thought was, I don't, that's not the way it's typically phrased with me when people talk to me about church. And I, I heard that, but I thought, boy, there's a lot of truth with that statement. I mean, there's a part of me that just wants to be done with that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, God called me to this. God called me to this. You know, Moses had some frustrations when he worked with people. You know that, right? And then I have frustrations with myself when I look in the mirror. You ever look at yourself and you're like, boy, I, I, there's another side of me that just I'm not proud about. You know what I mean? And I, I look at that stuff and I, I, I think about the stuff that I've gone through And I think about his question, or are you done with that? And there's just a part of me that wants to say, yeah, I want to be done with that. I want to open up that fish and bait tackle shop in, you know, South Texas and do saltwater fishing. And then there's another part of me that says, I'm still in the fight. 
I'm still walking with him. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about. And I think as us, as those of you, all of us, I mean, you, you want to walk with God. You want God's will for your life. You're temp- tempting to walk by faith. And there's, there's things that happen in our life that rattle us, that shake us, that make us wonder if God's a God of love and justice. And God, I'm still hurting, but I'm still here. I'm still, I'm still don't know, but I'm still here, God. I, I still don't have, that prayer is not answered, but I'm still here, God. And we kind of go through through that. And then you have to make this decision, kind of like with Jimmy up here, you have to make this decision of, I'm going to choose to walk with him. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. So I share that with you because I want you to know this message is not just a message behind a pulpit. This is my life. This is not just a bunch of ideas from some commentators and and Bible scholars and theologians that I'm going to regurgitate. This is my life. You with me? You with me? I I think it requires faith. It requires endurance to walk with God. Uh, But but in Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews raises this warning, this question that theologians have wrestled with for literally centuries. And people don't like Hebrews chapter 6. You don't, I mean, if you're going to rip out a page in the Bible, you might want to think about Hebrews chapter 6 because it's, it, it's, in, it, it's controversial. And there's just like a, about three verses that are really controversial. And, and, and I'll, I'll talk about why behind that. But let's look at it together, guys. Hebrews chapter 6. Let's start at verse 1. Would you stand up for, with me, guys? In honor of God's word, I think uh, we stand up for the flag. We should stand up for God's word. Why not, right? So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ. What does it say? Again and again. Let us go on instead and become, what church? Become mature in our understanding. That means grow up. That means spiritual, spiritually mature. Pastor Jeremy talked last week that you shouldn't be on, a, on the bottle the rest of your life. You shouldn't be in the high chair. You should move on. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of, of what church? Of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. We're going to talk about that later. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and, and eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward to further Understanding, for it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. When the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, it is useless. The farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it. Dear friends, Even though we're talking this way, we really don't believe it applies to you. We're confident that you are meant for better things, things that come with salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you've worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers, as you still do. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then... You will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. Lord, open up our eyes, soften hearts, tear down walls. I pray that we have a radical encounter with your spirit, O God. Change us. I pray minds are changed here, Lord. Speak to that person who's watching online right now, God. Change their mind, God. Lord, I pray that that weeds are pulled out of hearts today. 
I pray that, that men humble themselves before you. I pray that women turn to you with all their heart. God, I pray for that person who's just far from you. I pray they turn to you. And I pray for that Christian who needs to repent. Would you move in their heart as well? And by your grace, God, work in me and through me, Lord. By your grace, thank you for your faithfulness in my life. Thank you for your mercy and the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you for using me in spite of me. Thank you for the way you spoke to me this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, please be seated, guys. You know, God knows how to encourage. God knows how to encourage. When I was in, in D.C., Grace was working during the days. And um, so I decided, I, I thought, well, I don't want to stay at a hotel all day. I'm going to go, you know, venture out a little bit. And I, I found this... Uh, it's like a French bakery breakfast place, like about a block and a half away from the Capitol. And I just scored. It was great breakfast. And, and then I decided to walk to this coffee shop, Ebenezer's Coffee Shop. Uh, there's a, a book called um, a Circle Maker. It's a book on prayer. It, it was written a few years ago. And, and uh, Mark Batterson is the pastor uh, of this church called National Community Church in Washington, D.C. And the coffee shop is a ministry of that church. So I decided, well, I'm going to go walk over there. It's about a 25-minute walk. So I walked. And, and while I was there, I worked. And that's where I worked out of Ebenezer's and had a great time there. And, and, and I got to, I got to uh, Mark happened to jump by or drop by, and I, I talked to him. And, and he prayed for me back in the summer of 2012 when I was at a low place, and it was such an encouraging time. I thank God for that, and uh, I'm so grateful God knows how to encourage us. You know that? God knows how to encourage you, and he knows how to do it in a way that's just private and special for you. He can do that. Uh, the message title is Losing Your Salvation. It's a scary title, Losing Your Salvation, and uh, that's why we called it that as a title. But uh, I want to remind you that, uh, that these Christians, quote unquote, are going through a lot. And the writer um, of Hebrews wants to talk to them uh, about not walking away from their relationship with God. In verse 1, the writer says, so let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. So remember, he's talking to Hebrew Christians. And he's saying, you guys remember this, right? You know, you remember what, what this is all about. You remember Romans chapter 3, verse 23, right? You remember 6, 23. You remember that? You remember Romans chapter 5, verse 8, don't you? And John 3, 16, and John 3, 3. And you remember Jeremiah 33, 3. You know, call him the Lord and he'll answer you. I mean, surely you remember all this. And you remember that our righteousness is like filthy. Right? I mean, you remember, place your faith in, 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 in Christ. And you remember that, that we need our sins to be forgiven. And don't you remember? These are the basic fundamental things. But the second part of verse one says, surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting, repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. So I want to make sure you see this because as we go into the controversial verses of verses four, five, and six, as we go there, you have to look where the writer starts. And he's talking about this word repenting. Well, what is repentance? Repentance in the Greek, in the Greek translation, metonia, it means this, a change of mind, a change of mind. It's this idea that someone was thinking one way and, and now they're thinking a new way. Now, really, it, it really, I mean, it implies change of mind and turning to God. That's how we've, we've, you know, we connected in the New Testament. But repentance alone literally means a change of mind. And it's this idea of, of, you know what, for me to walk with God, then I need to have an attitude of repentance. Repentance. You know, a change of mind. It's this idea that, um, let me put it to you this way. Is it possible to walk with God if you never repent? Is it possible to truly walk in, like in close proximity with God if you don't change your mind as the Spirit of God speaks to you? 
Because that's when, that's what happens. The Spirit of God speaks to you and says, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. You, you had the wrong attitude there. You shouldn't have said that to him. You shouldn't have said that to her. You shouldn't have done that last night. You shouldn't have, whatever it is, the Spirit of God is coaching us and umpiring us and teaching us how to live a righteous life. And at that moment, when we feel the prompting of the Spirit of God in our heart or our mind, we have this crossroad where we have to decide, am I going to repent? Am I going to change my mind and recognize, take ownership and say that was wrong? I want to make things right and I'm going to do whatever it costs. I want to make things right and I'm going to repent. So really, this whole controversial thing starts with this question, do you believe in the doctrine of repentance? Do you believe repentance is essential in walking with God? That's really where this whole thing starts. Do you believe that a holy God requires us to completely turn to him? Do you believe God's not done with you? You believe you haven't arrived? I have not arrived. I'll just tell you that. If you're farther along than me, then you need to help me because I have not arrived yet. I'm still growing myself. But can I walk with God and intentionally sin? The Bible talks about unintentional sin. That's sin, those things that we do that we have no idea we did that was wrong kind of thing. But then you know, the Bible also talks about um, intentional sin. There's intentional and unintentional. Unintentional and intentional, I'm saying. Anyway, so we, when, we, when we know what's right, then we have a responsibility, right? That's kind of the connection. When we know what's right and what's wrong, that's when we have this weight of responsibility of what will we do with that. And the question is, can I intentionally sin and walk in close proximity with God? You think God's okay with that? Is he okay with that? Can I walk with God and and lie? Occasionally? How about cheat? How about steal? How about dishonor? How about hate that friend? How about hold a grudge? Can I hold a grudge and walk with God? We try. Right? We try. Can I, can, I, uh, can I not forgive someone? Can I do whatever it is, any wrong or whatever it is? Can I have these internal things can, and, and say I'm walking with God? The opposite of a repentant heart is a, is a prideful heart, a stubborn heart. That's the opposite of a repentant heart. That's someone who elevates themselves. And what I've discovered many times, God allows us to kind of go on our own joyride. And we think... We're at a certain place, and then God shows us our heart. And then we have this point where we can choose to turn to him. And that point is uh, different for us. But I I, I believe, I I think about the woman who was caught in adultery. Such a famous story. You know, my first question is, where's the man? Ladies just go, "Mm mm-hmm. You know what I mean? All the ladies, "Mm mm-hmm. Where's the man? But uh, in this story, it's an incredible story of this woman who's caught in the act of adultery and she's dragged out and she's surrounded by these men and they're all, you know, righteous people. They're all church people and, and, and they're ready to, you know, she was caught in the act of adultery. The law says to stone her using scripture. Isn't that horrible? Using scripture, we can twist the Bible and do all kinds of stuff, can't we guys? using scripture, and then, you know, scripture says Jesus, you know, he sat down, and he just kind of stirred, this, you know, whatever he wrote in the sand, and then he got up from the sand, and he looked, and, and he said this famous thing. I'm just going to read verse 11. You know, he, he said, you know, he, he asked her, Where, where's your accusers? And verse 11 says, no, Lord. Then anyone who condemned me says, no, Lord. She said, and Jesus said, neither do I go and sin no more. Isn't that beautiful? The only one that was qualified to throw the rock was Jesus. And he shows grace. He shows grace. That's your savior. Hey, Christian, that's your savior. That's the one you should follow. That's the example right there, Christian. There he is. You're not the example. Jesus is the example. It's not about your feelings. It's about your savior. 
Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. And you see this grace, this unmerited favor, this mercy that Jesus just shows her way. And it's full of, he's full of people around there who know scripture. All these people know the Bible. They know the Torah. They know it backwards and forwards. And they're ready to kill this gal. And she turns to Jesus and everything changes. And Jesus shows grace and mercy. But he says this last part, and I think we always forget this last part. He, Jesus told her, go and what church? And if there's a part that we want to X out, that's the part that we want to draw a line, right? But there's this expectation that God has that if you're going to walk with him, you're going to live a life of repentance as well. And as God checks you about stuff, about the way you treat your wife, the way you treat your husband, about what you look at on your phone, about what you watch on TV, about how you treat whoever, about that attitude, about that character, whatever it is, there is that point that God expects you to repent, change your mind and say, okay, I, I, am so, I want to be so close to God that I don't want anything to come between us. And if this thing is under God's skin, then it's under my skin as well. If it bothers God, then it bothers me because I want to be, I want to walk with God and I don't want anything to come between him and me. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody with me? You're just so passionate. You want more of God. And God just reveals just that little speck, that little thing, that stick in your eye, whatever it is. And you're like, okay, God, let's take care of that right now. If that's bothering you, then help me. See, God's in this business. Jesus is in this business of redeeming, restoring, healing, healing. I think about that woman who was caught in adultery. I think about the challenge she had of forgiving herself. I think about her living in a village where everybody knew. You know what I'm talking about? Like all your friends know what you did. Your whole family knows you just, the decision you made. And I see the grace of God. And I can only imagine where she's at. She's thinking, all that matters was my Jesus forgave me. That's all that matters was my Jesus forgave me. Scripture says they dropped the rocks from the oldest to the youngest. When he said, he who's without sin, let him cast the first stone. And they all started dropping their rocks from the oldest to the youngest. Let me say it this way. The most powerful moment in your spiritual life is the moment you change your mind. It's that moment when you say, I want to walk with God, and I want to be so close to God. And you know what? It's that moment when you say to yourself, I'm not going to be that person anymore. I'm not going to look at those things anymore. I'm not going to think like that anymore. I'm not going to say those things out of my mouth anymore. I'm not going to talk about him or her or them anymore. I'm not going to slander them anymore. I'm not going to blame anymore. I'm not going to hold a grudge anymore. It's an incredibly powerful moment when you say, you know what? I used to be unfaithful, but I'm faithful now. I used to be unloving, but I choose to be different now. I used to be sharp, but I'm just not going to be that person anymore. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a great German theologian, said this, repentance is ultimate honesty. That's where it starts. And I have to ask, you know, how honest are you with yourself? How honest are you? Can you look at your life and are you able to do a 
little inventory and assessment on your own life and look at yourself in the mirror and say, okay, I'm not going to reason. I'm not going to justify. I'm not going to blame. I'm not going to do anything. How honest are you with your own self? How honest are you? It's hard to be honest. Here's the truth. Maybe you're the problem. There's the truth. Here's our problem. We don't want enough of God's will for us to walk away from what we know to be wrong. That's our problem. We say, yeah, I want to walk with God or I want God's will for our life, but we don't want it enough to repent. We don't want it enough to change our mind about this. We don't want that enough. True repentance leads to a new way of thinking. True repentance leads to a life of obedience. True repentance is this complete surrender to the will of God. True repentance is choosing to die to yourself and turn to him. True repentance is a a desire to do whatever it takes to make sure you're right under his eyes. True repentance doesn't have offense or guidelines or whatever. True repentance is God, whatever you want, that's what I want. I want your will, God. That's true repentance. True repentance. And the writer of Hebrews is reminding these churchgoers that you never graduate from repenting. You don't ever clip out. You don't graduate. You don't get to a place where you never have to do it. I'm just telling you right now. I know I'm not there. (laughs) You never get to that place. When God checks you on something, you respond with with a repentant, repentant heart. And you have this increasing desire to live righteously. Now let's jump into these controversial verses. Verse four, for it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened. This word impossible is a scary word for us. Impossible. And you, you got to look at those who are enlightened. Who are the, in, who are the enlightened people? What are we talking about? Um, and, and, and you keep reading verse four. It says this, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit. They've experienced the good things of heaven and they shared in the Holy Spirit. These are those who are enlightened, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come who, who then turn away from God. So this is a part when it gets touchy because the writer of Hebrews is saying it's impossible. It's impossible for certain people um, to bring them back to repentance and the people who were once enlightened. So he's not talking about this is the woman caught in adultery. He's not talking about tax collectors and sinners. He's not talking about rapists and murderers. And he's not talking about all these people that we categorize as really bad people. He's talking about churchgoers. He's talking about people who grew up in the church. He's talking about people who have experienced salvation, have tasted salvation, have sang the worship songs, and have said, oh God, you are so good. Better is a day in the, in the house of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere. God, you're a good, good father. Uh, you know, they, they know the songs. They know them. Those who sing Amazing Grace or whatever it is. They know scripture, and that's who they are. These are the enlightened people, and these are them. And he's saying, uh, he's talking about these guys, and he's saying, um, you know, these people, they can get to a place, a spiritual condition, where it's impossible for them to repent. It's impossible. In fact, fact, verse 6 says, a new living says, who who then turn away from God, but a new international version says, "Who, who have fallen away from God. We don't like verse six. The idea that you can fall away from God is scary, isn't it? The idea that you can fall away from God. And verse six says, it's impossible to bring such people back to repentance by rejecting the son of God. They themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. So here's the warning right here. The warning that the writer of Hebrews is saying is, is you can walk away from God. That's the warning. Christian, the enlightened, 
you can walk away from God. Let me say it a different way. The writer of Hebrews is saying this, you can lose your salvation. That's the scary part. I mean, you can walk away from God. Do you believe you can walk away from God and have a great distance from God and you're still going to go to heaven? The warning can be taken two different ways. Here's the warning. One way we can take it is we could minimize it. This idea of you can lose your salvation or you can walk away from God, you could minimize that warning. And what you do when you minimize it is you can convince yourself that it doesn't matter how you live because the grace of God covers me. It doesn't matter the sin in my life because the grace of God is just going to cover me. It doesn't matter that I'm intentionally sinning. It doesn't matter how I treat others. It doesn't matter. None of that matters because God's grace is so great. He's just going to forgive me for all of this intentional sin in my life. You see, you hear that? You're minimizing the warning. It doesn't matter whether you serve or give or love or hate. It doesn't matter. None of it matters. It's kind of like you got this, you know, get out of hell card in your back pocket and you can live however you want. That's minimizing this warning. That's minimizing it. I have uh, several pastor friends that I just love very much. And I'm, I'm a lover of the local church. And I have several uh, Baptist pastor friends. And Baptists uh, are Calvinistic in their thinking. And uh, in their Calvinist thinking, they believe, you know, once you, once you get saved, you're always saved, right? That's their thinking. Once you get saved, you're always saved. So when they read this part of Hebrews chapter 6, and we read this spiritual condition of someone who was once enlightened, someone who's tasted the goodness of God, who shared with the Holy Spirit, all of these things, I mean, it describes pretty clearly what this person looks like. And it describes his spiritual condition that they can turn away from God and not repent and they can fall away or walk away, however you want to put it. And when I bring that up to them, they say, well, you know what the problem was? They were just never saved. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe this idea of repentance is something that we need to practice. And maybe we all have the capacity to what the Bible calls backslide. We all have the capacity to sin. And, and the other way we can take this is we could, we could exaggerate it. This warning we could exaggerate. When you exaggerate, you say to yourself, well, you know what, it doesn't matter. And there's no grace and no forgiveness for the Christian. I'll never be good enough. I'll never be good enough, and I might as well not try. And you just don't embrace the grace of God. So you could minimize it, or you can exaggerate it, and you have to be very, very careful because both extremes are not right. I want to say it this way. You can walk away from Jesus, but you can never walk away from his grace. You hear that? Think about the prodigal son, this famous story in the Gospel of Luke. The son leaves his father. He was still the son, but he walked away from his father. But remember the grace of the father. He stood on the edge of the road waiting for his son to come back home. You can walk away from Jesus. You can say, I'm not going to go to church anymore. You can say, I'm not going to read the Bible anymore. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to do any of those things. You can do that. And you're, separate. you're not walking with God anymore. You're separating yourself from him. But the grace of God is so great. As long as you have breath in your lungs, it's not too late. As long as you have breath in your lungs, the grace of God is extending over you and he's waiting for you to turn from, to him. That's the grace of God. Glory to God. And the grace of God can reach you in the strip club. The grace of God can reach you at that place at 2 o'clock in the morning that nobody knows where you're at. The grace of God can reach you on the streets. It could reach you in that high rise. The grace of God can reach you in the house. The grace of God can reach you even when you're filling your head with the wrong stuff. Aren't you glad for the grace of God? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. And that's, so you can walk away from Jesus. You could, in theory, hypothetically, 
but she could never walk away from his grace. I've wondered, I've wondered, why is this Hebrews chapter 6, these verses, why are they such a big deal for some people? Christians, why is it a point of contention? And here's what, I, here's what I've learned. Those people who um, live unrepented lives, they care very much about this passage. Those people who live compromising lives, they care very much about the interpretation of this passage. You know what I'm talking about? And it makes sense because if I was in their shoes, I, I, I don't like this. I would want to make sure the grace of God covers me. And, and the grace of God, of course, is big and it's great, but it's not cheap grace. Go and sin no more. Right? That was what Jesus told the woman who was caught in adultery. So I've just discovered those people who, who are living those, that compromising life have unresolved sin in their life. They care very much about this because they don't want to be that person who has fallen away. They're not honest with themselves. Here's what they're banking on. God's grace is so great that when they get to heaven, even though they have intentionally sinned, during their lifetime, intentionally sinned, knowing what God wanted them to do and knowing what God uh, expected. And they know that, but they chose to turn their back to the will of God. That person who has spent their life in intentional sin is banking on the idea that when they get to the pearly gate, great gates, the grace of God is just going to say, just come on in. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Now, let me just say this. At the when you get to the, that judgment place, um, it's just going to be you and Jesus. Your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your father. Nobody's going to be with you. It's just going to be you and the Lord. I guess it depends on what do you want to risk? I'm going to risk obedience. I'm going to risk as the spirit of the Lord checks me on things. I want to change my mind and I want to say, God, you got to help me with this. Let me say it this way. Those who truly love God are more concerned with how close they can walk with God and less concerned about how far they can walk away from God. Those who truly love God are more concerned with, I just want more of God in my life. I just want more of Jesus in my life. Right? Ladies, how would you feel if your man said, okay, what is this thing, you know, um, <clears throat> forever, for better, for worse? I said, I do. Are you okay if I date someone else on Tuesday nights? Are you all right? Well, you know, just uh, on Wednesday nights. How about that? Is that okay? I'm here, and when I'm here, I'm here, but I may not always be here, but I just want to know what can I get away with that you could be all right with? How does that feel, ladies? Does that feel really good? Do you feel loved? You have a God, a holy God, who wants to walk with you. And he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into this world to be a sacrifice for our sins. And Jesus said, go and sin no more. See, it's possible to live a righteous life. And as you do fall, and you will fall, at that moment, we need to repent change our mind and say, okay, God, I screwed up here. Forgive me, Lord. And you turn back and you continue to walk with God. The Christian needs perhaps more grace and mercy in their life than the non-Christian. Right? You know, I know I do. You know, as you walk with God, you know, because you learn about it and, and, and it comes down to, and, you know, do you want to be, you want to be that person? And the writer of Hebrews unpacks it a little bit, and in verse 7, talks about the spiritual consequence of someone who doesn't have a repentant heart. It says, when the ground soaks up the, 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 the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. Every farmer knows this. When the rain comes and the crop comes up, that's the blessing of God. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, it is useless. 
the farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it. So it's really weird because he's talking about Hebrews chapter 4 and 5 and 6 and this whole idea of falling away and unrepentant hearts. And, and all of a sudden, he, in these two verses, he uses this illustration of this farmer. And, and, and he talks about this rain falling down on this ground. But you have to understand something. He's describing someone who has an unrepented heart, who's not prone to repentance, someone who has a hard heart, someone who's unwilling to change their mind. And he says that person is like when the rain falls on them, there's no crop that grows. There's no fruit that comes out because of the condition of their heart. Because of the condition of their heart. And so there's this, I, the thing that I saw in this is the rain falls on, on everyone, on good ground and hard ground. But the good ground produces good crop, but the hard ground only produces thorns and thistles. When I, when I read that, I, I, I thought, boy, th this also says something else. This is the reason why you can go to church and you can get nothing out of the sermon. And the person next to you can sit in the same sermon and say, wow, that was amazing. I'm going to change this in my life. Because of the condition of your heart, what is repentance? Incredible honesty with yourself. That's where it starts. So if you're incredibly honest with yourself and you make yourself vulnerable to the will of God and God speaks to you, there's this wonderful fruit that comes out. Good things come out. But an unrepented heart can actually prevent you from hearing God and can actually, an unrepented heart, you have a stubborn mind, you're unwilling to change. It actually can prevent you from success. You know, here, you know, you hear, you know, a lot of people say it's, it's YOLO, right? You only live once kind of thing. But, but Christians, we believe you live twice. You live once in this world and once in eternity. So with the decisions we make in this world matter to God. And the person, yeah, the person who lives with, with, right with God says, it matters to God how I live today. So I want to make sure as I walk with God, if my heart's not right, and if he checks me on something, I'm going to repent. I'm going to change my mind. And if that means I need to call someone and ask for forgiveness, I'm going to do that because I'm so passionate about making sure I'm right with God. If that means I have to go make things right and I have to square up with, I mean, if I have to do whatever it is, I have to do whatever it is. I'm so passionate about walking with God. I want to make sure that I'm right. So I'm going to make sure that happens. It's really interesting, these thorns and thistles things come up, and, 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 and the Lord kind of brought me to that verse, this idea of, of um, an unrepented heart is like this field that bears thorns and thistles. And I thought, what in the world are thistles? I mean, anybody know what thistles are? I had thorns, you know, I, I think we, most of us, but what are thistles? And I looked in Scripture, and did you know thorns and thistles comes up early in Genesis chapter 3? After Adam and Eve sin in the garden, it's one of the curses of the ground. And verse 18 of Genesis chapter 3 says, It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. So thorns and thistles grew after sin entered the world. Think about that. Thorns and thistles grow in the stubborn heart as well. Thorns and thistles grow in the unrepented heart, the proud heart. And when it grows in Jerusalem during this time, the thistles were so popular. It was like this wild flower that just grew all over the place. Today, I pulled up weeds in my backyard. Oh man, I neglected it. If you would have seen it before, it was horrible. I had like vines growing. It was like a jungle in my backyard. It was so embarrassing. But that's what happens when you leave weeds alone, don't you? You leave one alone. And what happens if you leave one alone? Yeah. 
And what happens if you leave those alone too? Yeah, eventually they'll just take over your grass. You know what a thistle looks like? Here's what a thistle looks like. Here's what it is. It looks in one, in one, on one side, it looks, um, can we have a picture of a thistle? I don't want to make sure you see that. Um, it's like has this beautiful flower, but it also has these thorns. They're, they're prickly. They're prickly. They're prickly. And I thought about this and I looked at this thing and, and did you know the meaning of thorns and thistles is associated with aggressiveness, pride, and pain. Every time you look at in scripture, you see thorns and thistles. It crowds out God's word. It prevents God's word from growing inside of you. It affects the desires of your heart. It literally takes over your life. Thorns and thistles. That's what it is. It, it, it decreases your capacity to love. It decreases your capacity to extend grace and mercy. You become angry. You become hard. You ever met someone who's just angry and prickly? I looked at this and I, I looked at those thistles and I thought, I know people who look like that. There's one side of them that's beautiful, and then there's another side. You know what I'm talking about? Do you know anyone who looks like that? And it's affecting their life. It's affecting their heart. As I'll tell you what, I see someone like that, and I see their potential. And I want to tell them it's not worth it. That stubbornness that you hold, that pride, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. The devil has no problem with people who go to church. You know that. You know what the devil has a problem with? When that person has a moment and they change their mind. And they say, I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to get right with him. I'm not going to look. That moment, that metonia moment, that's the moment right there that the devil has an issue with. He has no problems with the person who reads the Bible and attends church and even gives. No problem with that. Let me say it like this. If you refuse to honestly change the way you live for God, then eventually you will become spiritually indifferent, numb, and you will care less about God's will for your life. If you refuse to honestly change the way you live for God, if you say, you know what, I don't care, I'm not going to change, eventually what happens when you continually disregard God's word in your life, when you continually ignore what God is telling you, you refuse to change your mind, eventually the thorns and thistles will take over your heart and you won't be able to remember the last time you turned to God. In your mind, you will see yourself as superior. In your mind, you will see yourself that knows everything, but in your heart, there's no fruit in your life. There's no fruit. The rain will fall. So this big warning is for us. And I love the way verse 12 ended. It says, then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. And those last two or three words really, really spoke to me. Faith and endurance. You need faith and endurance to walk with God. If you're thinking about walking away, let me just say it really clearly. It's not worth it. Sometimes we look at the other side of the fence and we say their grass is greener. You know what that means? That means you need to water your grass more. Sometimes we think, oh, if I walk away, then this, I mean, it's just a lie from the devil. Real growth happens when you walk with Jesus and you're willing to change your mind on anything that he says you need to do that differently. 
You need to change that. You need to do that differently. That's where real growth happens. God loves you. There is no situation you're in right now that's impossible for God. There's no financial situation that you're in is impossible to God. There's no hurt that you're carrying that God is not able to heal and help with. There's nothing that you're going through that's impossible. God will carry you through. He is faithful. He is a good God. He is a good Father. He just wants to walk with you. He wants you to walk with Him too. That's what it's like. I think I'm done, guys. Well, I want to give you an opportunity. I want to give you an opportunity. Um, I want to say a prayer for you. And I'm going to ask you to do a bold thing. We haven't done this in a while. Um, But if you just need special prayer because of what you're going through right now in life, maybe you've had an unrepented heart. You have more stubbornness than humility. (laughs) Or maybe there's something else that's just pressing you and you thought, maybe I should walk away. Maybe you've thought maybe I should walk away from God or maybe I should walk away from this relationship, whatever it is, you're just in the fire right now. In the fire. Um, I want to pray for you. Is that cool? Um, But I want to ask you to come with me and let me pray for you. So would you, if that's you, would you just stand up and come with me right now? Stand up right now and come forward. Come with me. Come on up. And let's gather up right here. And I want to say a prayer for you guys. Come on, anybody else want to just come? You just feel like, I need to pray. I need to pray. Anybody else? Come on. Anybody else? Anybody on this side of the house? Anybody? Yeah, I just need to pray. All right. God, I just thank you for these good people that have come forward. And I know you're moving in hearts, and I praise you for that. And Lord, I just, uh, you know what they're going through right now and you know what that person is going through that's sitting down. And God, I pray for your will to be done. I pray that you work a miracle. I pray that you pull out thorns and thistles from every heart. And we, together, we repent. We change our mind. We turn to you with all of our might and we say we want your will, God. So God, work in our home work in our life. Forgive us for our sins. Take care of our future. And we want to see you move. We want to walk with you, God, in a fresh way. So God, right now, we just make this vow. We don't want anything to come between us and you. Thank you for your good grace, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, God bless you guys. Would you give them a hand for just their courage to come down? It's so cool seeing um, people come together, even strangers hold hands while they're praying. Isn't that beautiful?